Uh, we are so glad that you have chose to spend your morning with us this morning, especially if you are a visitor with us. Uh, good news, this is the last week you're going to have to put up with me. Next week, we'll be joined by our senior pastor. Leave it to your family. We'll be joined by Brett Parker and his family next week, and we are excited about that. We're also excited as this past week, uh, the decision was made to bring uh, Craig Cunningham on uh, to the staff here in a permanent basis. Uh, and so he's doing a fantastic job. Yeah, it's certainly... We are excited about that as well. <clears throat> Here recently, Tiffany and I began watching a show based on the events that took place during Chernobyl. Anybody remember that? That was the uh, nuclear power plant that exploded in the Soviet Union in 1986. Now, if you're planning on watching that show and you haven't started yet, you might not want to listen. I'm going to throw out a few spoilers but they're going to be kind of like spoilers. If you watch the movie Titanic, the boat's going to sink. So you don't have to worry too much. But we start watching this show. We sit down and we're in the second episode. Uh, it's, it's been the end of a long day. We're just kind of relaxing on the couch. And so we decide to turn it on and watch an episode. And during the first episode, you see the explosion happen. Uh, but they don't really know all what's going on. They think it's, it's no big deal yet. They don't really know that the core... Uh, explosion has happened and caused all this radiation to leak out. During the second episode that we're watching this week, they begin to understand some of the ramifications as to what has actually happened. And they begin the evacuation process of the town right there. They know that they can't fight the fire with water, so they're bringing in helicopters and dumping sand on the fire. But they realize that there's a problem. Underneath of this reactor in the basement of this building, is three or four holding tanks of water. And if that water is not drained, it's going to cause a massive problem. So in one scene, they bring in the, the group of guys still left who has worked at the power plant. They have to know what they're doing if they're to go in to the facility. And they ask for three volunteers to go into the basement directly underneath this nuclear reactor that has exploded and is now on fire. Was they're talking, all the men quickly realize that this is a death mission. If they do this, they're either going to die immediately, and if they're somehow fortunate, they may live another couple days before the radiation has time to take effect and kill them. So finally, three men decide that, that they will step forth. They understand if nobody does anything, not only are they going to die, but so are millions of other people. And so they begin to prepare themselves. And they put on radioactive hazmat suits. They are given flashlights, and I think they're called Geiger counters. The little devices that tell you if there's radiation around. Some of you are smarter than me. You can tell me if that's right. But they detect when there's radiation, and so they'll hear, you'll hear just a tick, tick, tick as they're getting ready. And so they began their trek down into the basement. Now keep in mind, there's been an explosion. There's been a fire. Things look a little bit different than what these men expect it to. And so the scene kind of builds. They're trying to find their way by flashlight through this building that they once knew to get to the control panel to empty these tanks. And the more they walk, the faster those ticks start coming. Tick, 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 tick. As the radiation continues to build. As they finally get near their destination, one of the flashlights begins to flicker and it dies. But they continue on. Tick, 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 tick. By this point, those radiation detectors are basically screaming. Tick, 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 tick. And the scene continues to build. And another flashlight flickers and it dies. They're about to reach their destination when the third one quits and they're left in total darkness. And it's the end of episode two. Tiffany looks over at me and she says, Are you kidding me? That's where they're going to leave us? She's not a big fan of cliffhangers. I'm not really... Have you ever invested some time? Of course, the TV show, they want you to come back next week. But have you ever sat down for a movie, an hour and a half, two hours, and there's just not a good ending? They leave you hanging, and now you don't know how long you're going to have to wait for the next one to come out to answer the questions that you may have? Well, we've been in the book of Acts since September of last year. That's quite a while that it's taken us to cover this. 
28 chapters. I think it's been a pretty neat experience. I hope you've enjoyed it and learned as I have. We've had, I think, at least six or maybe seven different people preach from this book during this time. I don't know if you remember, but, but Robbie alluded to the fact that this book was a little bit like Paul Harvey's The Rest of the Story when we kicked off this series. That the book of Acts was actually a sequel to the book of Luke. It picks up right where Luke left off in the Gospel accounts. And it chronicles the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. And it highlights the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. You may remember that that taking place for the first time on the day of Pentecost as Peter delivers a message and over 3,000 people come to believe in Jesus that day. The early church comes together in such a way they're sharing all their possessions in a way that the world has never seen before. And it's taken seriously by those folks. It was taken seriously by God. Anybody remember what happened to Ananias and Sapphira when they lied about what they were giving? They died. They both, you know, we was talking about this after, after that message and my wife didn't believe me, but I said, we sang a song about that in children's church. She said, how'd it go? I said, they both dropped dead. So it's kind of a really cheery song for, for children's church. She never sung that one apparently, so I don't know what y'all were teaching me as I grew up here in this church. But I remember that Ananias and Sapphira both died. So, giving probably increased in the early church following that event. And more and more people continued to believe in the good news of the Gospel. But as that began to happen, that of course posed a threat to the existing powers. And so we began to see the persecution of the early church as well. We saw our first Christian martyr in the man of Stephen. Yet the more opposition they faced, the more the word spread. One of the greatest opposers to Christianity was a man named Saul. But Saul met Jesus on a road trip. And he became so changed that he even changed his name to Paul. And he would go on to be pivotal to the spread of the Gospel. As a matter of fact, Paul wrote a good bit of the New Testament that you hold in your hands today. The hope of the Gospel was initially brought to the Jewish people. Yet in chapter 10, Peter had a vision, you may remember, that opened the doors for all people to believe. And this caused quite a bit of friction between the Jewish people and the Gentiles. And then here the last month or two in the later chapters of Acts, we, we have seen Paul's missionary journeys and the places that it has taken him. But Paul begins to face his own opposition now. He's beaten. He's stoned repeatedly. And we've seen him here lately unfairly imprisoned for over two years of his life. And then finally, once he appeal, appeals to Caesar, he's sent on a ship to Rome, and what happens but the ship has shipwrecked. They find, we find him here in the 28th chapter on the island of Malta, shipwrecked. And so our story has kind of built and built, and we're excited to see what happens in the life of Paul, but here's another spoiler for you, we're not going to find out. The book of Acts leaves you on a cliffhanger. It's an unfinished story. But I do think there's a few things we can take from our text. And the first is this. God has a plan. If you will turn with me, most of these verses will be on the screen if you don't have a Bible with you. But to Acts, the 28th chapter, that's where we're going to hang out most of the morning. Beginning in verse 11. After three months, we put out to sea in a ship that had wintered in the island. It was an Alexandrian ship with the figurehead of the twin gods, Castor and Pollux. We put in at Syracuse and we stayed there three days. From there we set sail and arrived at Regium. The next day the south wind came up and on the following day we reached Puteoli. There we found some brothers and sisters who invited us to spend a week with them and so we came to Rome. The brothers and sisters there had heard that they were coming and they traveled as far as the Forum of Apius and the three taverns to meet us. At the sight of these people, Paul thanked God and was encouraged. When we got to Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with a soldier to guard him. When you think about it, the entire book of Acts really is a story of God's plan unfolding. 
I mean, the book basically begins with Jesus' ministry after His resurrection and His disciples are pumped up as He's come back to life. They think that He's about to rule the world and yet the next moment, they see Him ascend into heaven. And they're thinking, now what? And yet Jesus told them, it's better for you that I leave. It's better for you to receive the Holy Spirit. You see, even though they couldn't see it, God had a plan. We see the church face massive opposition and persecution. That's likely not the path they would have chosen. And yet, despite that opposition, it only caused them to grow more bold. And the Gospel spread like wildfire. They may not have been able to see it in the moment, but God had a plan. The Jewish people were God's chosen people, yet so many of them rejected the Gospel message that God opened the doors for all believers. Even though everyone maybe didn't understand, God had a plan. And in our text today, the verses we just read, we see the path that Paul had to take to get to Rome. He knew he was going to Rome, but I'm sure he wouldn't have chose the path that he did to get there. Yet read his words in Philippians 1. The book of Philippians is is one of the letters Paul would have written while he was imprisoned in Rome. So while he is unfairly stuck in a prison, this is one of the letters that he would have written. Philippians 1, verse 12. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the Gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the Gospel without fear. See, it may not have been the path that Paul would have chose, but he understood that God had a plan. So what is it in your life that you're struggling to see God at work in? I don't know about you, but I like to make plans. I like to have things laid out how I think they're going to go. But pretty often it doesn't work out the way that I think that it should. But do you trust that God has a plan? Uh, For Christmas this year, my father and mother-in-law, are they in here this morning? They might be in the back. Oh, no, he's up there. Okay, you don't want to listen for a few minutes. They purchased for my children a very nice swing set. I'm, I'm actually very grateful. But I jokingly asked, does this come with assembly? And the answer was no. Or it does, but you're the assembler. But it was a swing set my kids had seen several times walking into Sam's Club. It has two towers. It has a tunnel. Yeah, that picture doesn't do it justice. But this is actually what I've put together. So you can see it worked. But it has a a climbing rope. It has uh, two different stair sets. It has three or four climbing walls, a slide, racetracks, chalkboards, all kinds of stuff all up in there. And so... All they received for Christmas was a picture of this with the promise that your father would eventually put it together. So I had seen the picture, but I'd never seen even the boxes. And so, of course, they were getting excited as the weather began to get warmer. And so I went over to their barn and began to load up these five humongous boxes. And I pulled the cars out of the garage and I began to lay out piece after piece after piece after peace, after peace. And I looked at this mess and I thought, this is going to be a weekend. And I found the box that had the hardware in it. You know those little blister packs, bubble packs that hardware typically comes in when you have something? This had 16 bubble packs and three additional bags of loose hardware. It came with an instruction booklet that was 197 pages long. It was thicker than most textbooks I had in school, and I studied it far more than any textbook I ever did, I promise. It referred you to some YouTube videos that each were about five or six minutes long, and there were 11 of them, where all you saw was the sped up version of what it should look like when you're finished. So now typically, I am not a man who reads instructions. I frequently have someone standing behind me saying, you're doing that wrong when I'm putting things together. But I typically don't read them myself. But in this instance, I knew if I didn't, the results were going to be disastrous. 
You see, I had to trust that the people that made this knew what they were doing. The people who wrote the instruction book had an idea what the ending picture was going to look like. I think, I need that picture back up. I spent three days on that. <laughs> like three 12-hour days. I think it ended up pretty well. But when I laid out all those pieces, I had my doubts how things were going to end up. So what is it you're struggling to see? What next step are you terrified to take? Maybe you've never accepted Christ and you would say, you know what, I don't think God has a plan for my life. But I'll tell you, you're wrong. You see, I think you can break people into two groups, Christians and those God is still pursuing. You may not know Him, but He knows you and He has a plan for you. He wants you to know Him. He wants you to love Him. He's revealing Himself to you even today. I would say it's a part of His plan that you're here to begin with. And for you, Christian, what is it that you are in the midst of that has you terrified? What is it you should be faithfully taking that next step in, but you step back and say, I don't see how this works out. You see, God has a plan and we can trust that it is good. But trusting God's plan is not an excuse for inaction. Augustine says this, Pray as though everything depended on God, Work as though everything depended on you. In the 17th verse of our text today, Acts 28, we read this. This is right as Paul gets into Rome. He's under house arrest, essentially. He has a soldier who will be guarding him all the time. And this is what he does. It says, three days later, he called together the local Jewish leaders. When they had assembled, Paul said to them, My brothers, although I have done nothing against our people, or against the customs of our ancestors, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. They examined me and wanted to release me because I was not guilty of any crime deserving death. The Jews objected, so I was compelled to make an appeal to Caesar. I certainly did not intend to bring any charge against my own people. For this reason, I have asked to see you and talk with you. It's because of the hope of Israel that I am bound with this chain." You see, Paul didn't arrive to Rome and say, okay, I've done what God has asked me to do, now I don't need to do anything else. And he gets to work furthering the kingdom. You see, I think there's often this idea that, that trusting God means we need to be hands-off. We love this idea of letting go and letting God. And it looks great on a bumper sticker, but it can be in contradiction with Scripture if the idea is that you no longer have to strive for anything. Now, God certainly controls everything. Everything works to His plan, but that doesn't mean that we don't reach for excellence. Whether you're a pastor and stand on this stage every week, whether you're a construction worker, a school teacher, you stay at home with your kids, your every effort should reflect the glory of God. And all of your life's work should reflect His beauty. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6 says this, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers and sisters, to keep away from every believer who is idle and disruptive and does not live according to the teaching you have received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked night and day, laboring and toiling, so that we would not be a burden to any of you. We did this not because we do not have the right to such help, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you to imitate. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule, the one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. We hear that some among you are idle and disruptive. They are not busy, they are busy bodies. Such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and to earn the food they eat. And as for you, brothers and sisters, never tire in doing what is good. Never tire in doing what is good. You know, I think if we want to be an effective church, if you want to be an effective Christian, there's a time where you have to put your money where your mouth is. The world's not going to bat an eye if all you offer is platitudes. The only way to make a difference is through your actions, through the grace of God. You know, I think that's why we see such success, such an impact with some of the events that take place here at the church. Like the fireworks event that's coming up. So many of you give sacrificially for that, and we thank you for that, so that people can come in here, feel comfortable, and hear God loves you, and so do we. We want nothing else in return. 
or the VBS that's going to be taking place here in a couple weeks. It's a little bit of work, isn't it, Janie? A lot of effort, a lot of time comes into these volunteers so they can spend just a few hours each day for a week pouring into these kids. They're putting their money where their mouth is. Or the rice packing or the Operation Christmas Child where we give meals and presents, giving a little bit of joy to people we'll never meet. You see, I believe our efforts in pursuing Christ should put to shame any effort you see from the world and worldly pursuits. As a Christian, we should do it better. Now that's not to say we remove God from anything we're doing here as a church. We don't rely on our own efforts. We certainly rely on Him. And to remove Him would be fatal to our efforts. We understand that. Isaiah 64.6 says this, All of us have become like the one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. Now some people read that and say, you know what? My righteous acts are like filthy rags. Why should I even try? I'm going to pray about it, and I'm just going to stay out of the way so I don't mess that up. But that's not what these verses mean. God delights in your obedience. These verses mean if you were to try things outside of Him, outside of His will, then it's like filthy rags. All your attempts at righteousness outside of Jesus is useless. Worse than that, it's disgusting. But it doesn't mean we don't make an attempt inside of God's will. God delights in works that are grounded in His obedience. So within the confines of His grace, we do the best we can. We strive for excellence. And then we can walk away with the peace and freedom of understanding that we're not judged by how successful we are by God. Or by how much we get done. You're being measured by how much you trust in His name. How much you trust that He can take any mess you may make and use it to glorify Him. And use it for the good of you and everyone around you. Even in the times that you don't see or understand how. So now let's jump to verse 23 of our text. Acts 28. It says this, They arranged to meet Paul on a certain day and came in even larger numbers to the place where he was staying. He witnessed to them from morning till evening, explaining about the kingdom of God and from the law of Moses and from the prophets, he tried to persuade them about Jesus. This is Paul again within his home. Some were convinced by what he said, but others would not believe. They disagreed among themselves and began to leave after Paul made this final statement. The Holy Spirit spoke the truth to your ancestors when he said through Isaiah the prophet, go to, these, go to this people and say, you will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts, and in turn, I would heal them. Therefore, I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will listen. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and talked about the Lord Jesus Christ without boldness and without hindrance. You see, all those events that led up to this story in the book of Acts that's where we're left. That's a cliffhanger. We have no idea in the book of Acts what happens to Paul. You can turn to the person in your life or to your left or right and say, is that it? I want to know what happens. But I think maybe the book of Acts ends as an unfinished story because it's the story of Christ's church. And that story has not yet been completed. That story lives on in you today. So how will your story end? You know, we can actually piece together what happened to Paul a little bit. I won't leave you totally in the dark. If we look at some of his letters that he writes to churches and some other sources, it's widely believed that Paul's actually released from prison at this point in time. Uh, he, he's probably held for the two-year limit and no accuser comes to Rome to bring a case against him. And so he's likely released. We know from some of his writings he goes into other places of the world continuing to share the gospel. And then finally he's arrested again. If you read the book of 2 Timothy, you'll see a letter that he writes the second time he's arrested and imprisoned in Rome. And you understand that he realizes he's 
on his final chapters of his life. And then finally, he dies a martyr's death. So even though this book leaves us without an ending, we can piece together what we believe happened in Paul's life. But how about you? How will your story end? You may say, listen, I'm almost done. I've lived a good life, but I'm getting up there in age. My story's been written. Or I've messed up so badly, mine's already been chiseled in stone. There's nothing I can do to go back and change that. C.S. Lewis wrote this, you can't go back and change the beginning, but you can start where you are and change the ending. You can't go back and change the past. You're right. But it doesn't matter how you've messed up. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter how old you are. You can change today. And as long as there is still breath in your lungs, the Lord isn't finished with you yet. He still has a plan for you. There's a reason you're here. So how will you write the remaining chapters of your life? In Luke 12, verse 16, Jesus is speaking and He says this, The Lord of a rich man produced plentiful, and he thought to himself, What shall I do, for I have nowhere to store my crops? And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grains and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. Sounds a little bit like the American dream, doesn't it? Gather, gather, gather. The last 25 years of my life, I get to sit back and play. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Do you want your life to matter the way the early Christians did? Do you want it to matter more than you want to be liked by people? More than you want nice things, more than even you would like a nice retirement. You see, it's not a tragedy if you don't end up with any of those things. What's a tragedy is if you value any of those things over a relationship with Christ. So many of us work and work and we base our life meaning on what we have and God would say to you, you fool. You've wasted your life. John Piper says this, You don't have to know a lot of things for your life to make a lasting difference in the world. But you do have to know the few great things that matter and then be willing to live and die for them. It was interesting this morning watching people come in and and you get to see people enter into different stages of their life. And as my kids start to grow a little bit, I I can see how busy we have made our school-aged and teenage kids. They're so busy in, in groups and Band and sports, they barely have a moment's rest. And then they graduate high school and they graduate college, and we say, Now's the time you got to focus on your future. You got to bear down right now to get where you want to be. Or maybe you're in the stage of life where I am and you're raising kids and you don't even get to go to the bathroom by yourself anymore. Your schedule is so busy, you don't even know what day it is. You know, sometimes we become so wrapped up in our children's success here in this world, we don't have time to focus on anything else. Or maybe you have entered retirement. An American dream now tells you you've earned it. You've worked for it. You've done your part. It's somebody else's turn. You get to play with the time you have left. Now all those things may be good things. I'm not saying they're not. But if that's what your life is built on, then you're wasting it. You see, Jesus forces us to make some radical decisions. And I think we can pass through those stages of life and we think, if we can just clear this hurdle, if I can just get to this next stage, everything's going to calm down. Then I can do something. And if we're not careful, our life is gone in a flash and we've wasted it. Philippians 1, verse 20 says this, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed. This is Paul writing again while he's in prison but will have sufficient courage so that now as always Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. You know, I want my life to count for more than just my years here on earth. If I'm fortunate, I maybe have another 30 or 40 years left. I want my story to resonate beyond that. 
The only way for that to happen is for it to be so intertwined with Jesus that it resonates for eternity. Now that may look different for each of us. Maybe for you, you've never accepted Christ. You've never made that decision. And the best way for you to glorify God today is to be obedient in baptism. Here in just a moment, Craig's going to come back up with us and lead us in a song of invitation. And if that's you today, I pray that you would come as we begin to sing. Maybe for you, you're a little bit like me and it's time to declutter your schedule a little bit. Maybe it's time to say no to some good things so you can say yes to some great things. Maybe it's time for you to sacrifice financially. Paul goes on in Philippians 3 to say that everything he has, he counts as loss for the sake of Christ. What is it you've been hoarding that you need to count as loss? It could be furthering the kingdom. Maybe you've reached what you know is your final stage of life. My plea is you don't waste those final... 5, 10, 15, 20 years. That through God's grace, you would find a way to make His name great. Whatever it is, I hope that we as a church here in Sardinia, and we as individuals, begin to trust in God's plan and allow Him to write the story for us. I'm going to leave you with Acts chapter 20, verse 24. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and to complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. If you need to make a decision today, I pray that you would come. The water's ready. We have clothes ready for you. There is nothing holding you back. Will you come as we stand and sing a song of invitation?